All right. Well, thank you for joining us. My name is Kelly Piper with the California Healthcare Foundation, and we're really excited to uh, share this webinar with you today, Treating Maternal Opioid Addiction, the Buprenorphine Basics. We've got two great speakers today, Corey Waller, um, who is with the Camden Coalition, and he's going to be going through the science and um, medical side of treating maternal addiction and neonatal abstinence syndrome, making the case for um, buprenorphine and other medications to manage women who have opioid addiction during pregnancy. And then we'll turn to um, Diana Kafra, who with the San Francisco General Family Medicine Program, who's going to talk about the practicalities of starting up a buprenorphine practice to treat pregnant women, as this service is, is unavailable for most women in rural areas and, and inadequately available in our urban areas as well. So um, you can go to the next slide. In terms of housekeeping, we um, because we anticipate a large group, we're going to have everybody muted, but there is an opportunity for question and answer. Um, we, if you want to ask a question, you can use the question box, which is on the um, webinar control panel. If you have a question regarding logistics or challenges with the technology, you can just ask um, the organizers, or if you have a question that's related to the content, um, feel free to invite the whole audience, and we'll be answering some of those questions in the webinar itself. I'll tee those up for the speakers, and some of them I'll be addressing directly in the chat box. Um, we will also record this session and the slides and the recording, and some supporting materials will be available to you, and we'll send you those links next week. Next slide. So we will um, make these emails available to you also at the end of the session. Um, we're now going to switch over to Dr. Corey Waller's screen so we can get started with the presentation. But we, um, this is such an important topic for California, and the California Healthcare Foundation is committed to advancing addiction treatment access to all people, no matter what their situation, and in, um, hopefully one day getting to a place where we have no wrong door. And people in pregnancy at the emergency room and primary care and specialty care can get the treatment they need. So I'll turn it over now to Dr. Corey Waller. Thanks, Kelly. So we're going to try in a pretty short amount of time to just give an overview of the, uh, the major issues that come up with uh, treating pregnant mothers who have a substance use disorder and specifically focusing on the opioid use disorder aspects. I mean, despite the fact that we still have a significant amount of alcohol use disorder, marijuana use disorder, and benzodiazepine use disorder, the big one uh, right that we've been focusing on uh, recently is uh, uh, moms with an opioid use disorder and kind of the evidence-based treatments around that. So as we get started, you know, I want to make sure that we uh, know that I have no disclosures. I don't receive any funding from pharma or device. I, uh, um, I'm not on anybody's payroll except for a nonprofit in Camden, New Jersey, so um, nothing to get in the way of the information. The goal today is just to kind of understand the basic demographics of um, pregnancy and addiction, know what the screening tools are that can be used and kind of should be used, and know the medications that we uh, have available for pregnant moms and what their respective outcomes are, and understand the risk of neonatal abstinence syndrome and uh, and, and kind of the breastfeeding questions that uh, always come up. So that's a lot, so we're going to keep it thin, uh, but we're going to deep dive, Dr. Kopp is going to deep dive into the buprenorphine at the end of the talk as far as uh, how to actually, on the ground, make that work. So let's start with uh, the basics of, um, you know, the issue that we're dealing with. And so we have 15.8, you know, million women of childbearing age that are, uh, you know, using illicit drugs, and that doesn't even include the adolescents that, you know, we also have to, to deal with. And then when we start to look over at neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is uh, the withdrawal syndrome that you would see in a newborn, then we find that that's been significantly going up over the last few years. And those uh, two, maternal opioid use and newborn suffering from opioid withdrawal, you can see from 2006 to 2012 that's gone up. And I will let you know that as of 2016, 15, and 14 data, the trend has continued. It has not leveled off. And that continues to, to happen around the country as we go. And uh, I had run a clinic in Michigan before I moved to New Jersey that was dedicated to treating uh, mothers who had addiction to any substance. And we found that it was really hard to keep up with the volume that was occurring on a regular basis. So one of the issues that I want to start with is just the screening piece. And screening is important 
because you can't treat what you don't find. And what we find is that nationally, less than 10% of OBGYN practices actually screen for addiction on a regular basis. And if you don't screen for it on a regular basis, you're, you're just not going to find it. So talking through what are the ways you can do it and what are the barriers to that, a lot of uh, people say, well, which ones do we use? How do we use it? And, and who does the screening? How do we put this into our normal kind of modus operandi and, and get this done on a regular basis? And there are two basic things that can be done and can be asked by a, a medical assistant. They can be asked as a routine part of the initial intake. And, and these are the verbal screenings that you can look at. And one of those would be the, the TAs um, and the tweak, which really look for issues with alcohol and are the pregnant versions of what we would use uh, instead of some of the older uh, questions we would ask for the general population. And then the four Ps, uh, which I think these are the easiest ones to ask and uh, seem to be well received from all patients and the places that we've implemented these, they've understood them uh, quite well and they answer them with pretty high fidelity. And one is, you know, do any of your parents have a problem with alcohol or drug use? Uh, it's important that if you do institute these that you ask the question in the exact way that it's written because they've been studied and validated as such. So the big issue that we're looking at with these is whether you're having a medical assistant do this or the patient is reading a questionnaire and answering the questions or you're doing it as a part of your normal intake as a uh, provider, asking the question specifically as it is written is really important because other enhanced meanings to these can change the answer and then really invalidates the, uh, the screening tool. And uh, Kraft, um, has really uh, been helpful. And we started onboarding this, especially in our uh, uh, pediatric practices uh, for the females and, and OBGYNs for uh, what we're going to be trying to find because the questions were really focused more on the younger age uh, person. And so while the four Ps can be used for all, Kraft is a little more focused on the younger population. And, uh, and you can tell by some of the uh, uh, the questions and, and how that focuses like the R is do you ever use alcohol or drugs to relax, feel better about yourself or fit in, which is uh, more of an issue around adolescence and early adult than it is as we move uh, uh, through time in our life. But the, the biggest issue is that 10% number and there are a lot of uh, barriers that come up and some of the common questions that will come up that uh, we have pretty good answers to is well what do I do with that information and how do I send patients to, to get help. I mean, what if we look and I find it, then what do I do? Well, one of the major things is that you can identify um, how to treat a lot of these things yourself, which we'll talk about in a second, but also just making sure that you've identified one or two people in the outpatient setting who feel comfortable in the addiction space treating pregnant patients and just aligning yourselves with them very closely so that you have a uh, closely connected pathway to send these patients off to. Um, and again, that, that shouldn't be scary. If we don't look for you know, placenta previa, we're not going to find it. If we don't look for fetal abnormalities, we're not going to find it. So we do all of those things. I mean, we do universal screening for syphilis, and we had a total of 400 cases uh, last year. And, and so even with 400 cases, we still 100% of people get screened for syphilis, whereas um, a disease that has a significant rate of stability and treatment, uh, such as addiction, is screened less than 10%. So I could spend a lot of time being on the uh, the pulpit for this one just because it, we can't get to them if we don't find them. But these are the validated screening tools uh, that have been utilized on a pretty regular basis. Well, what do you do if you find it? So if you find a mom who's on opioids and they're illicit opioids or even uh, uh, prescribed opioids, the treatment pathways come down to one, do they have addiction or are they on these medications for chronic pain? Because we had patients in our clinic who would be on chronic opioids for things like rheumatoid arthritis or sickle cell disease. And it, for those patients, you don't necessarily have to flip them to another medication, uh, depending on which one they're on. So oxycodone, which we know all of the issues with that drug in general, but at the same time, it's the only one that's category B. And uh, I've used that successfully during pregnancy for people who had identifiable pain that you couldn't control in other ways. And the outcomes, if taken consistently and not misused, are, are the same as if you use buprenorphine or methadone. So 
Um, if you have a patient who does not meet criteria for addiction and they're prescribed opioids and they need to continue those opioids to be able to function for the remainder of their pregnancy, that then really the secondary protocols for post-operative treatment and that still look a lot alike and a lot of the same care has to be taken. But if you do find that a patient has a substance use disorder, uh, specifically in this case an opioid use disorder, then you really have three uh, choices. One and the most common one that's out there is abstinence-based treatment. Uh, it's still the most common. Now, the coalition of, this has been studied over and over again in a number of different populations, and the most validated percent effective rate actually is in um, pregnancy because those, that group was looked at specifically and they actually had good denominators in those studies instead of what we find often in some of these studies, which is a missing denominator uh, problem. And what I mean by that is you can start with 100 people and the study doesn't look at the outcomes of all the 100, they'll look at just the ones who finished the, um, the intervention. And so if 100 people started and 30 people finished the intervention, instead of saying it's 30% effective, what they'll look at is that those 30 people that finished, what percentage of those are still um, abstinent at one year? So when you do that, that messes up the, uh, uh, the numbers in that, and so it, it creates some uh, craziness around that. So the 16% effective rate is preventing relapse during pregnancy for less than one year retention and, uh, for one year retention and uh, treatment. And, and that's not very effective, uh, 16%. So that means it's 84% ineffective. And there have been a few studies recently that talk about the safety of, um, to the baby, not to the mother, the safety to the baby of, de of weaning mom off of her medications and delivering the baby drug-free. But that maligns all of the literature that's out there that shows if you prematurely wean a mom, the risk of relapse is through the roof. And, uh, and those risk of relapse is greater than uh, 60 to 70 percent in many of those studies and they fail to talk about that and what they talk about is that yes we can physically wean somebody off of these medications without causing problems with the baby but they fail to answer the question of should we given the other pieces of data that we have so other than the abstinence-based treatments we have two major medications that we uh, use for uh, for these moms and one is methadone and this is the most studied uh, medication and it's still pretty much considered the gold standard. The vast majority of the studies that look at retention and treatment at one year, which are the outcome studies, um, that's the outcome metric that the vast majority of st studies use, is that it's 65% uh, percent effective uh, to 80% percent effective at its highest rate. And that, that gap narrows a little bit and is probably on the higher end for pregnant patients given the different change in their motivational state during pregnancy as compared to the standard population. And um, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that if we're going to use methadone, it not only decreases the risk of relapse, but it increases the chances of the baby being born at term, increases birth weights, increases uh, the ability for the baby to uh, breastfeed appropriately, and, uh, and staying on the growth curve, it decreases the chance for mom to go back to jail, to get HIV, to get hepatitis C. All of these very positive things have been shown pretty consistently with the use of methadone. And one of the nice things about uh, utilization of methadone is if it's available to you, let's say you're urban, if you're in an urban area and you have an opioid treatment program, then this is very rigid um, in its treatment, meaning they have to show up daily and that means they have a lot of contacts uh, with people. And being isolated during pregnancy definitely leads to uh, uh, depression and other issues, including relapse. And so having them uh, being able to see a supportive uh, person on a regular basis is really important. When we, uh, but methadone has a lot of stigma about it, and it's also not available in a lot of areas, uh, especially if you're in the more rural areas. And for that, we look at buprenorphine. And this shows for the retention and treatment, the evidence coalesces around 50 to 65% effective rate. In our clinic um, in Michigan, we had uh, close to the 80% retention and treatment rate, but we were also the main facility that saw these patients. And, uh, and so we kind of knew about them and we communicated well, and we had a lot of help in uh, you know, helping our patients to stay connected to the clinic. So I can't say that you can just drop this medication into any clinic and have that if you don't have those surrounding 
um, helps, but still 50 to 65 percent effective is a heck of a lot better than 16 percent um, at, at one year. And it's becoming really the more prevalent medication and may even move more into the gold standard of medications over the next few years with a few more studies, especially once we have studies that solidify our ability to use the combination product, which is the buprenorphine naloxone, because those have a lower diversion risk. And, um, and some of those formulations also have a, um, a lower total dose in each pill, so the diversion is less and there's less naloxone in it. So like the Univale as compared to Zubzolv or as compared to Suboxone. And for that, uh, that's nice because it can be done in an outpatient setting. It can be onboarded with uh, eight hours of training for the person prescribing. Now we have uh, PAs, uh, physician assistants and nurse practitioners who will be able to write for the medication. So this subset of patients can be pushed off into a um, not really pushed off, but integrated into a, uh, a part of the clinic that is focused on this and without having to dedicate physician time. So there's a lot of positive reasons for buprenorphine. And one of the bigger ones now is uh, the mother study, which is really the, the sentinel study for the evaluation of safety and efficacy for buprenorphine as compared to methadone in pregnancy and especially in the after birth. And what we find is that um, mothers who are on buprenorphine deliver babies that have a lower severity of neonatal abstinence syndrome and require a shorter stay in the hospital. Both of those are positive. And if you set it up, and we'll talk about breastfeeding in a second, but if you add breastfeeding into that, then ultimately what you find is you get a lot of these babies who can go home with mom in a very reasonable time and you know a short amount of time, like four to five days, and never even have to go to uh, the ICU. And those, that's been studied pretty closely um, over time. But I have found, and we'll, again, we'll talk about it in a second, that a lot of places seem unwilling to allow for breastfeeding, especially if the baby ends up in the NICU. And there's just, there are no data to really support that pathway uh, with only a very few exceptions. Uh, when we look at uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome by itself, this is opioid withdrawal. And in a neonate, it's no different than an adult. It's just that they can't tell us about their symptoms. So we have to use what they call a modified Finnegan score, which looks at hyperactivity, irritability, hypertonia, uh, some difficulty or excessive suckling, and uh, high-pitched cries. These are really subjective, and uh, you can find some pretty interesting numbers when you do inter-rater reliability studies, when you look at how one nurse would evaluate it versus another one, and you would get different scores by up to 20%. And also, if you add swaddling or uh, um, just skin-to-skin -skin kangaroo with baby on mom, uh, that significantly decreases the score. So it depends on whether or not you're scoring a baby who is stripped down laying in uh, under a heat lamp or if you have one that's swaddled being held by mom. Um, those, are, those are very different looking uh, neonates and so we have to determine what is the more consistent way uh, to evaluate them and once that's done you can then compare apples to apples because right now we have studies that are comparing treatments without actually doing the same things to settle the child. And we know that uh, you get a pretty big release of dopamine and oxytocin in the neonate when they have skin to skin and when they're breastfeeding. Um, and those by themselves can actually replace some of the aspects of the opioid in this area of the brain called the locus ceruleus. And so that part of the brain is responsible for um, opioid withdrawal and, uh, and doing those things up front can significantly decrease the need for the neonatal ICU to have to add any other pharmacotherapy. And because this has been a little bit all over the place, and as someone who's uh, board certified in addiction medicine um, and trained in neuroscience, it's really interesting to see that in the, in the NICU, the vast majority of the time, they're doing things for opioid withdrawal syndrome that we you know, stopped doing 15, 20 years ago uh, for patients. And uh, now we know that it is 90 to 95% about the release of norepinephrine from the locus ceruleus in the brain. And that can be mitigated pretty specifically with clonidine. And there are studies uh, that show uh, the effectiveness of this, but mostly it's been used as the third line medication rather than the first line medication. And so I think this is definitely an area that should be explored 
in our uh, uh, NICU, by our NICU teams because the safety profile for clonidine um, is actually pretty good based on the studies I reviewed. Now, I'm not a neonatologist, and I'm sure that's up for significant debate, but at the same time, we need to make sure we look at um, other ways to do this, especially if you have a, a baby who is not going to be able to be breastfed and not be able to be swallowed appropriately, which I, it's hard for me to imagine those, those situations other than if uh, mom is still actively using and or too sick uh, to do so. But at the same time, utilization of the right medications are there. And also answering the question internally about why we're even treating it. Uh, we find that European literature is pretty good about saying that if you just have a kid who breastfeeds and send him home with mom, there's no mortality rate associated with that uh, for opioid withdrawal. And when the question comes up, well, we have to treat the suffering of the neonate, I have to, as a neuroscientist, say suffering is a, a part of the brain that's not active in a neonate. They feel pain, there's no question, but suffering is the emotional response to that pain, and they don't have yet the full capacity to have a suffering response as stated. And so many times we treat our own suffering um, you know, for these uh, babies rather than actually uh, doing that. And that may end up having a kid in the ICU for uh, a month for something that could have been treated with breastfeeding. So I, I think it's worth reevaluating each of these things that we do for uh, children while they're um, newborns and how we evaluate them, what our treatment protocols are, and if we're going from least heavy to heaviest medication um, at the beginning, and I would say that clonidine would be the least heavy medication moving up the ladder to us starting to add things like morphine and methadone uh, to it. But breastfeeding is, uh, I think, really the key to a lot of this. And about 95% of our moms breastfed, and they had really good experiences in the hospital. Uh, it's been well documented that for buprenorphine and methadone, um, that there, it's low, there are low doses of it in the breast milk. So immediately, they go to a pretty significant step down of the amount of drug that they're receiving through breast milk, um, whether it be buprenorphine or methadone. And then we find that um, the neonates who are exposed to methadone or buprenorphine for a minimum of 30 days, which is what imparts kind of a physical dependence, uh, they had definitely shorter lengths of hospital stays, as we talked about, and a lot less need for pharmacotherapy. And the Walkman study is great, but there were four or five other studies before that that showed the same thing. And this is um, really pretty known literature, but yet it's not implemented. And then we have the other piece, what it does for um, the mom that we forget. So one of the biggest issues with addiction is a depletion of central dopamine in the reward system. And so that equals craving and it also equals a decrease in onboarding of emotional memory and all of this stuff. And so we have this really unique opportunity after delivery where the body can produce and release oxytocin. And oxytocin really does mimic in the brain what dopamine does. So even if they're dopamine depleted, they get a really pretty parallel bump in reward from this oxytocin. And so when they, um, you know, when they're skin to skin with the baby and they're, you know, breastfeeding and they're having that contact, it is uh, increasing that reward signal. It's increasing the bonding because this is also happening in the neonate. Then you get better sleeping, better feeding from the neo neonate and mom. And then it's really just better all around. And so, we have the neuroscience to back it up. We have the, uh, uh, the data to show that it's low doses that are in the breast milk, which tells us that it is a weaning, a natural weaning process by itself. And then we have the data to show that it definitely decreases lengths of hospital stay in that. So it, it makes it hard for me as I walk through the logic of the pieces of data that we had. If I was prosecuting a case, this would be a hard one for the jury to say no to, given that each piece of this has been evaluated agreed upon, but yet some hospitals actually still have staunch uh, restrictions on breastfeeding for, for other things. Now, there are contraindications, and those contraindications are things like HIV positive. And so if mom is HIV positive, then you don't want to, um, the protocols for that have been well established and you don't want to breastfeed. If mom is still actively using illicit drugs and, um, and not stable, then obviously you don't want to expose, accidentally have that child exposed to something like uh, cocaine, amphetamine, or uh, fentanyl, the synthetic opioids, things like that, uh, which can have a profoundly uh, problematic outcome. 
The one that's still questionable at this point and actually really relevant to you guys in uh, California is the marijuana use. Um, the studies, NIDA has landed on kind of a National Institute on Drug Addiction has landed on a middle road with this. And I would, I would tend to agree with that in the sense that the European data that looked at a large cohort of females found that mothers who smoked marijuana during pregnancy were more likely to deliver a child who had um, attentional, emotional uh, problems later in their uh, um, childhood. And so they, like ADHD or um, emotional problems, but whether or not that was from the familial aspects or direct cause and effect from uh, marijuana, we don't know. And even if it was a direct cause from marijuana, what we don't know is, is that because they used it once in the first trimester, trimester during neural tube development, or for four days in the third trimester when the prefrontal cortex is forming, or we don't, we don't know the answers to those questions. And, um, and if they've used during pregnancy, there's a significant decline in the amount of THC that is in the breast milk. And, and since marijuana also has its own neonatal abstinence syndrome, Breastfeeding is probably still indicated in this group as long as there's not a significant uptick in the utilization. And again, they're not, they're not HIV positive or actively using illicit drugs. So there are no solid data in this, but if you look through what is available and you follow kind of the, uh, the logic path of, you know, what is best for mom is a lot of times best for baby and, and vice versa. And so if we have the bonding that's better, we have the uh, connection with oxytocin, we have the shorter length of stay, we have the decreased need for other pharmacotherapy. Um, this is probably still advantageous, um, if not you know, better than uh, not breastfeeding in that, in that case. But at the same time, this is still a really large area that has been neglected in research, I think, as far as how we follow it up. But what we do have, there haven't been any negative studies for breastfeeding in a mom with stable addiction on uh, methadone or buprenorphine. They've all been equivalent or better. And then it comes down to appropriately treating mom postoperatively for her pain, which is going to be discussed um, in the next one. So as we look through this, uh, the biggest issues that I want to leave you with before we uh, you know, move to the second uh, presentation is an understanding that if you don't screen for it, you can't find it. And we have validated screening tools that are specifically uh, directed toward um, pregnant mothers or those of the uh, age cohort that puts them at, uh, at that stage in life. And we also have toxicological studies that can be used as a snapshot evaluation. Sometimes that can get murky standardizing that from a cost perspective or now you have to, uh, you know, if they're mandated reporting things in your state and how those are written. So there are some of those things. but just asking the questions, um, I think it's basically starting to really reach the, uh, the level of malpractice not searching for this when we know it's a significant level of risk for preterm delivery um, and uh, low birth weight and risk of uh, you know, mortality for mother and baby for that for sure. And then we have evidence-based treatments that are 60, uh, 50 to 80 percent effective depending on which one you choose and which location. Uh, which is much better than the current, which is the abstinence-based uh, therapy, which is used in a lot of places, is only 16% effective. And the relapse rate for mom is huge. And uh, so the risk of weaning mom off of these medications just so that the baby can be born without anything in their system, uh, which again means that you're going to negate the, the ability to breastfeed if you're not going to reintroduce it at that point. Um, it just seems to be flawed in the logic of that as well. And then if we look at neonatal abstinence syndrome, really thinking about how the merger of the neuroscience derived against the treatment for adults can be merged into the treatment of uh, um, neonates is really important because we've figured out how to do this. And I, I can treat, no matter how many morphine equivalents of patients on, we can really adequately treat opioid withdrawal in an outpatient uh, setting for pretty much any adult and, uh, and have no untoward outcomes. And, and then the other is making sure that as many of the mothers that don't have specific contraindications are able to breastfeed because it absolutely brings together all of the things that we need to stop the cycle that we talk about so often. And that cycle of baby getting pulled from mom or having to be away from it and the uh, risk of emotional relapse after because they feel guilty because their baby is in the uh, 
ICU and they can't do anything about it and they're not being engaged. All of those things are improved when you have a team working for mom and, and mom and baby are bonding appropriately. So with that, I'll move over to, uh, a lot, uh, to a deeper dive conversation about utilization of buprenorphine in the, uh, in the office setting and how to do preoperative, postoperative, and all of that. And I'll leave that up to uh, my colleague. And then we'll take questions at the end. Sounds good. There's a few people have teed up questions, and I'm writing them down, and we'll definitely get to them at the end. Um, I'm now going to introduce Dr. Diana Kaffa, again with the uh, Zucker Works San Francisco General Hospital, their leader of their family medicine program, and a full spectrum family doctor who's going to talk about um, some of the building blocks of, of starting a buprenorphine program in, in a uh, community setting. So, um, Diana, take it away. Great. Thank you. And thanks, Dr. Waller, for walking us through the data. I think, I, I hope that um, just hearing Dr. Waller speak and kind of living, living in the present moment um, and having seen some of the data yourselves, uh, that you feel pretty comfortable with the idea that buprenorphine is a potentially very helpful, life-saving treatment for pregnant women who have opioid uh, use disorder. And that buprenorphine can be particularly useful for improving neonatal outcomes, right? So as a family doctor, I'm always thinking about the maternal infant diet. How do I support this diet? How do I get both of them launched on this new life um, with the best chance that they have? And this is one of the reasons that I particularly love being able to offer buprenorphine because I know I can stabilize the mom, I can give her a shot at rebuilding the life she wants to rebuild, and I know I can give the neonate sort of minimal um, exposure to whatever discomfort there is um, with neonatal abstinence syndrome and potentially even, there's some suggestion, um, potentially even lower rates of low birth weight, lower rates of preterm birth. So what I want to talk through with you is how do we actually make buprenorphine available to pregnant women? What are the things we need to put in place in our health systems to, to make this happen? If you go to the next slide, I'm going to go through just a few specific building blocks that I think are helpful when we think about implementation. First, relationship, relationships with outpatient buprenorphine prescribers. Second, having an outpatient pharmacy that will actually carry buprenorphine. So we're really getting down to the nitty gritty now. How do we make this happen? Third, you need to have a protocol or some kind of plan anyway for initiating buprenorphine, and we'll talk through each of these. Fourth, a protocol for intrapartum management, um, C-section management and postpartum care for these, these women. This is particularly helpful for your nursing colleagues. They're going to want clear protocols and guidelines about what to do in these different situations. And then lastly, and this seems small, but it took us a good year to get this to happen in our hospital, getting buprenorphine on your hospital formulary so that when a woman is admitted in labor, and is on buprenorphine, you can continue to give her the buprenorphine and not run into all kinds of complexity there. So I'm going to talk you through those. Let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk first about the relationship with outpatient opioid um, or buprenorphine prescribers. So as you know, in order to prescribe buprenorphine in the outpatient setting for the treatment of substance use disorder, you need a DEA Data 2000 waiver. You need a special waiver. So for her prenatal course, a woman will need a DEA waivered, a Data 2000 waivered prescriber. She will also need a Data 2000 prescriber postpartum. So if you're working in a setting where a woman is seeing um, an OB in, for prenatal care, but then afterwards doesn't have a provider, that can be tough. So one of the things we need to do is make sure we have a clear plan for who's going to manage people's buprenorphine while they're pregnant and who's going to manage their buprenorphine after they're pregnant. If they're seeing a family doc, that person can kind of hold the thread both before and after delivery. But if they're not, the obstetrician does need to have some kind of system for handing off the buprenorphine prescriber to someone else. Um, the other note here, for patients who are hospitalized, whether they're hospitalized for a cellulitis or for labor or for a high-risk pregnancy, patients who are hospitalized, you can prescribe buprenorphine without a Data 2000 waiver. So everyone on your labor and delivery floor does not need to have a Data 2000 waiver. For those 
hospitalized women, uh, anyone can write the prescription. So when we're thinking about doing inpatient inductions on buprenorphine, in other words, starting people on buprenorphine in the hospital, the people who are doing that don't have to have a data 2000 waiver. But when you discharge the patient, she does need to have a data 2000 waiver. The, the prescriber needs to have a data 2000 waiver. So one of the questions you're going to have to ask yourselves as you look into building this program in your own hospital is, who's going to write the discharge medication? That person has to have a data 2000 waiver. So it may be that you have the person who's going to be taking up prescribing postpartum write the discharge uh, medications for your patients. That's what we do in our system. So there are a few different models people use to develop these uh, relationships. One is to integrate buprenorphine into the prenatal care. So that's what we do in our setting. I'm a family doctor. I prescribe buprenorphine. I also do prenatal care. And so I prescribe buprenorphine as part of people's prenatal care. And then when they come to me postpartum, they're just my primary care patients, and I'm prescribing buprenorphine. Totally reasonable approach. Um, our, our obstetricians here on campus also, some of them have data 2000 waivers and they just integrate uh, the treatment into their prenatal visits. Or you can have a dedicated opioid treatment program that offers prenatal care on site and often those programs have a lot more wraparound services. So for example here in San Francisco we have a methadone program that also offers buprenorphine and they have a specific part of their program that's for prenatal care. So they do prenatal medical visits, they have parenting groups and uh, prenatal groups and so there, there's kind of intensive wraparound for those women who participate in that program. So that is another option. You can also just separate prenatal and addiction care. So you could have an OB doing the prenatal care and have an addiction psychiatrist doing the buprenorphine prescribing. And as long as they're communicating with each other about the patient's treatment course, their medical course, their stability and addiction treatment, and as long as they are able to communicate a discharge plan with each other, that can work just fine. We do have some data to suggest that people do better when the buprenorphine is integrated into their primary care. Um, we, we may have slightly better outcomes in those cases, but you work with what you have, right? And so if what you have is a situation where it's easier to separate them, that's totally fine to do. If you're trying to find somebody to prescribe buprenorphine for a patient, say after discharge, uh, or in parallel with their prenatal care, you can use the SAMHSA buprenorphine treatment locator, which I've linked to. I assume you guys are going to get a PDF of this and, and can link to it, or you can just Google SAMHSA buprenorphine locator, and it'll pull up the names of hundreds and hundreds of people who prescribe buprenorphine on a map, and you can just type in your zip code and find folks that way. Next slide. The other thing you'll need then, once you have a clarity about who's prescribing, is a pharmacy that actually carries buprenorphine. Now, uh, Dr. Waller alluded to the fact that in pregnancy, we typically recommend using the buprenorphine mono product. So for non-pregnant people, we use buprenorphine naloxone. We use a combination product. The naloxone in the combination product is an opioid antagonist that if you inject, so if you were to inject your buprenorphine tablet, the naloxone will overwhelm the buprenorphine, will lock onto the uh, mu opioid receptors, and will lead to opioid withdrawal. If you just use the buprenorphine-naloxone combo sublingually, the naloxone does not get absorbed, and people just experience the, the effect of buprenorphine without an experience from naloxone. So it's just, um, it's just a deterrent uh, to injection, is essentially what it is. In pregnancy, only the buprenorphine monoproduct is FDA approved. Um, there have been some studies showing that you can use the buprenorphine naloxone combo product um, without any ill effects, um, but the most conservative approach is to go ahead and just use the buprenorphine monoproduct. And this can complicate things at the pharmacy. So even if your community has been prescribing buprenorphine to people, probably what the pharmacy is used to stocking is buprenorphine naloxone combo. So prior to starting to prescribe buprenorphine mono product to pregnant women, we recommend giving a call to the pharmacy you're going to be using and letting them know to make sure that they order some and have it on site. Um, if you can't get the pharmacy to, to order it for you, get in touch with the re regional manager of your pharmacy. They can order it. They can get the, it there within one to two days. 
uh, buprenorphine naloxone combo product is covered by Medi-Cal without a prior authorization. Buprenorphine mono product, you, you may have to do a prior authorization, but it will go through if you just say that she's pregnant. Next slide. Okay, and then you want to have a protocol or a plan for actually doing buprenorphine inductions. Buprenorphine inductions can be performed in the outpatient setting or on the labor and delivery floor. Either one is an option for a pregnant woman. Um, we don't have great data to guide us on who should get inpatient and who should get outpatient. A common practice is to do outpatient inductions in the first two trimesters and inpatient in the third trimester for fetal monitoring. Um, some places do all of them inpatient just so they can have an eye on the baby. It's probably not necessary to do that. It's probably fine to do them outpatient. Uh, but th that, that's something you'll have to decide in your organization. Uh, you'll want to come up with some guidelines for who should be monitored and when. And again, we're in a little bit of a data-free zone here. Many organizations do go ahead and monitor in the third trimester, do fetal monitoring. Um, usually with intermittent monitoring, it's not even clear that that's necessary, but it is a common practice. You want to have some protocol about how to assess the mother's degree of withdrawal. So there's something called a COWS scale, the Clinical Opioid Withdrawal Scale, that you can use to assess whether the mother is in mild, moderate, or severe withdrawal. And when she's in mild withdrawal is when you want to start the buprenorphine, and you want to keep treating her until that, that withdrawal has been um, eliminated. And then you want to have a protocol for actually choosing a dose and then adjusting the dose, so a dose titration protocol. Now, I have given um, CHCFR protocol uh, that we use at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, um, and we're going to put that online for you. So you'll be able to take that, modify it, use it as you like. It has worked just for us very well as it stands, and so you're welcome to use that. Um, we have also found in our setting that it's really helpful to have a pager that people can call or a phone that people can call if they're doing their first buprenorphine induction and they just want a little coaching or if something's not going the way they expect it to and they want some help problem solving. So I, um, I personally carry the buprenorphine pager in our hospital uh, and anytime someone started on buprenorphine in the inpatient setting, they, I, people are instructed to just give me a call, help, let me talk through the case with them and help them out with that because it is new to a lot of people. Next slide. You're also going to want a protocol for managing pain, intrapartum pain, C-section related pain, and then postpartum pain. This is something that people get really nervous about. And I'll tell you, I uh, feel very confident at this point based on our experience and the experience of uh, colleagues around the country. You can continue the buprenorphine through uh, the delivery whether it's a vaginal delivery or a C-section, you can continue the buprenorphine. And then you can use either non-opioid medica pain medications or opioid pain medications to manage the pain. Okay? We actually have a number of studies now showing that if, as long as you continue the buprenorphine, you can give opioids on top of it, and those opioids still function to assist with pain. You can anticipate needing slightly higher doses of opioids, maybe 30% higher than what you're used to, mostly because of the woman's tolerance, actually, to opioids, um, we think, more than because they're competing with the buprenorphine, necessarily. We found that if you take people off of buprenorphine during labor or prior to C-section, they actually have worse pain afterwards. We do not recommend doing that. Epidurals are great in this population. Um, epidurals. Spinal anesthesia also works really well. So people, people have had good experience doing C-sections on patients on buprenorphine. You can still use your usual pain management strategies. Next slide. Okay, and last, you need to be able to actually hand buprenorphine to the patient while they're in the hospital. So getting buprenorphine on the hospital formulary is kind of a key first step to being able to offer buprenorphine to these patients. Um, we found that it's been important to have a champion who's willing to go to pharmacy committee meetings and explain to them why this is a new thing to add to the formulary and to provide them with key articles about the benefits of buprenorphine in pregnancy. Um, and Kelly, we didn't talk about this, but we could put a couple of those online too that people could use um, to get things through their pharmacy committee if they have to. So those are the basic building blocks that folks are going to need to get this off the ground. And now we'll open it up to questions. 
great. We've had some really good questions come in, and, and the one I think might be worth tackling first um, for Corey Waller is, is you know, what are the long-term risks for the infant with opioid exposure? And um, because there there was a question from Tennessee where the routine policy is to taper women off opioids, so obviously the concern is infants born with opioid exposure are they at risk of smaller brain sizes or long-term learning outcomes? Could you address that? Yeah, no, I absolutely can. Uh, so there are zero studies that show long-term negative effects of consistently utilized opioids during pregnancy. Um, the ones that have uh, said that there are effects are those in people who never did get treatment. And they're, it's the intoxication withdrawal cycle that seems to be causing the problems and the malnutrition that comes from constantly using uh, drugs. So it's not a, there, there are no papers that show direct cause and effect between the utilization of an opioid in a standard way where you don't go through that cycle of intoxication withdrawal and any changes in outcomes for the baby. They do have uh, physical withdrawal. However, that's mitigated in a short amount of time and that also has a zero mortality rate associated with it in uh, um, babies without significant congenital deformities or defects. And there was a question about the uh, uh, the paper by uh, Dr. Towers, and I think he's, uh, it's not even a paper, it's kind of internal data, and, and it's actually not, I would, I would hesitate to call it uh, level B, I think it's actually level C, it meets level C to C minus criteria for evidence-based research, and, and there's no one in uh, the mainstream of utilization or treatment of these moms who treat the whole thing, the baby and the mom, uh, that have any inkling that weaning a mom off of uh, medication-assisted treatment during, president, uh, during pregnancy is the right thing to do. Everyone, um, generally, I'm going to say everyone, 99% of the people who treat pregnant moms in the United States and in Europe um, agree that the risk far outweighs any benefit uh, that we get. And uh, since there are no documented cases of, uh, un of opioid uh, withdrawal mortality rate in neonates uh, in a normal uh, congenital neonate, and there are uh, significantly well-documented risks for overdose and death and relapse and continued use of drugs for moms that are not treated with medication-assisted treatment. I think it actually borders on unethical um, to force people to uh, lean off through, through either guilt, shame, stigma, or legal to make them wean off of their medications. Um, and I mean, you're taking moms who generally have a significant amount of early life trauma and using the trick of guilt in someone who already feels that way to get them off of their medications because of what they're doing to quote their baby um, is, I think it breaches um, the first do no harm ethic. I mean, I don't think I can um, speak this any stronger on my thoughts for that. And, uh, and, and it's not just where I am. I mean, I've worked in Michigan and Texas and, and um, in New Jersey and around the country, and it's really only a couple of states that even think about doing this. And interestingly enough, it's the states with the highest utilization of opioids and the least and the most restrictive treatment capability um, as far as access to care. So I would just, I can't say enough that that's not standard of care. Um, and quite honestly, based on the data, the, the large amount of data we have, shouldn't even be thought of. The, the study of it is almost immoral at this point uh, because of the risk to mom. So, Thank so you. And um, yeah, building on that, Dr. Kata, would you address this question of, um, you know, there's some concern if you do urine drug screens routinely with the um, prenatal labs, won't that in create women to avoid prenatal care? Won't they be afraid of the um, results of having their babies taken away? So. That, so I'm just wondering if you could address like what practice you recommend in prenatal care re related to drug screening to identify addiction and then perhaps a comment on policies, um, which we still see in some areas of rural California where a woman yeah. who's taking buprenorphine in, in treatment can still be um, referred to CPS and risk losing custody. Yeah, great. I think this is such an important question. And to me, the question is about why are women scared of us? Why are women scared of getting help from us? Because what we want is to identify a disease that requires treatment. That's what we're trying to do. And if instead it's perceived as us catching someone in the act of being a bad person, then yeah, they're going to avoid it and, and we shouldn't do it. But I think the, the solution is not that we stop 
looking for the disease. It's that we make sure people understand what that our response is going to be compassionate and appropriate and effective rather than blaming and stigmatizing uh, and, and disrupting a family, right? So when we identify an opioid use disorder, I think our reaction needs to be, all right, let's get you help with this. Let's get you to a place where you can parent your child the way you want to parent your child. That's the conversation. And I think if we as a community of providers can continue to do that, I think we can shift that fear some. Although laws, I mean, there are laws in some states that actually um, make the woman potentially criminally liable if she is found to be using drugs while pregnant, right? So in those states, I think it's a very different conversation. But in California, that's not the deal. In California, if you find that a woman has a substance use disorder, you do not have to report her to CPS, even for that necessarily, right? If she gets treatment and she becomes stable and she's indicated to you through her behavior that things are going pretty well, you do not have to refer her to CPS. And if you do refer her to CPS, let's say that there are some um, potentially, de potentially destabilizing um, factors in their situation, you can still be an advocate with CPS and say, look, I think she's doing really well in her substance use treatment. She's been taking her buprenorphine as prescribed. And you can help with family reunification. So I think of when a patient is on buprenorphine for an opioid disorder, I think of her as uh, potentially ready to be the mother that she wants to be. We should not be, we should not be referring all of those women to CPS at all. That's really helpful, and it's, um, I think, a real important job for California to start working with our rural areas and our um, judicial systems to get everybody on the same page as, of addiction as a chronic disease and that we shouldn't punish people for seeking treatment. Uh, Dr. Waller, there was a question about breastfeeding. Do you distinguish between different types of illicit drugs in terms of discouraging breastfeeding, whether it's heroin, cocaine, alcohol, tobacco? How do you make that decision? Yeah, this is a this is a really good question because I always make the point when I talk with uh, obstetricians or lactation consultants um, or pediatricians, you know, whomever seems to be putting up the barrier to breastfeeding, um, they've given up putting up the barrier to breastfeeding for tobacco. However, the uh, that actually has a possible untoward outcome of uh, SIDS, and it has a almost a double the risk of SIDS in the general population uh, using tobacco, but we've just all but given up on that. Uh, yet we're clamping down on things that have no data that uh, shows an increase in risk of mortality rate uh, for breastfeeding. And, uh, and ACOG and, and uh, American Academy of Pediatrics actually agrees with you know, breastfeeding in these instances. And I think many times it's more of the stigma um, issue, but at the same time, utilization of, an, a continued utilization of an illicit drug such as um, uh, methamphetamine or cocaine is, uh, is different. That's uh, one, those are not things that generally the patient becomes physically dependent on and uh, continued utilization of those can also have untoward effects on the, uh, the child if those are passed in breast milk and it also signals a significantly uh, less stable mom and so you can't predict what you're going to have exposure to. So the fact that a mom is stable in utilizing methadone or buprenorphine in this setting, uh, that consistent utilization of the drug yields the same stability for mom while decreasing the risk for um, withdrawal for the baby. That's great. There was a question about um, what is the research that shows the harm to baby for detox during pregnancy? We've been unable to find that research. Um, could one of you address that? The research showing harm or the research showing no harm? Um, so the, during, if you detox the, um, during pregnancies, in other words, you taper women off opioids, maybe the way to answer that is we'll send a follow-up email um, with the slides and the recording and include some basic references for the questions that have come up about no yeah. harm to the infants when using buprenorphine and methadone, harms when forcing women to detox off of opioids during pregnancy. Um, the these questions yeah. seem to come up. Yeah, just quickly, the main, the main harm is not, it's not a concern, I mean, there's some concern about withdrawal for the fetus, but really it's about the mother's relapse risk being unacceptably high. You're basically sentencing the mother to relapse, I think, when you do that. 
Yeah, it's, and there are many studies where it levels out at around 80%. So 80% relapse rate if you force women to detox during pregnancy. Correct. And we'll, we'll get those references uh, tidied up and out for you guys so that they can look at them. And, and if there was anything else that showed that much harm, we would just not even consider it. Um, if 8 out of 10 people were going to experience a negative outcome with a mortality rate is connected with that, that, I mean, we just wouldn't even consider it. In fact, it would be considered malpractice and physicians would be sued for doing it. So it's just, I think we have to be careful about how we're applying an, an emotional response to this issue rather than one of uh, um, scientific data. So Corey, I, when I was in my practice, I would often see nurses want to keep um, babies in the NICU as long as possible with the idea that they're protecting this child with just one more day of safety instead of sending the baby home with the mother, you know, even when the mother was in recovery. And I'm wondering if you can um, relate the relative um, harm of foster care and extent, you know, kind of the outcomes of foster care compared to working with moms in recovery to um, go home with their infants? Yeah, well, first I want to start with making sure that people understand that the, uh, the NICU nurse is the uh, most ardent protector of these children that I've ever seen. And I say that as a, uh, someone who in residency rotated through the, uh, a couple of different uh, neonatal ICUs. And uh, I almost had my hands cut off a couple of times by just about to touch one of the babies. So that's the protective instinct that they have to begin with. Um, but at the same time, thinking that you're going to save this baby by getting a baby out of the house um, really sentences that mother to uh, um, massive amounts of anguish and doesn't decrease the risk uh, to the baby. Because we find that if a mom is in treatment and is deemed stable by the team treating her, then the outcome for the baby as far as uh, graduation from high school rate, need of uh, mental health, um, I think most of it looked at dropout rate and absence of presence of depression and anxiety um, in, in preteen and teenage years is uh, actually lower going home with a mom who's in recovery from addiction, even with um, I think an average of two relapses over, uh, over the five year period that they studied. The, uh, these kids did much better in all of those outcome measures as compared to foster care, which seems to uh, significantly uh, mess with the kids' attachment capability. And so it really manifests as a, an attachment disorder because they're never able to completely and fully attach to a single parent-like person in a foster care system, which wrecks their emotional regulation around um, relationships down the road. This is a really interesting source of uh, information now, and it's being studied both retrospectively and uh, prospectively. But as you can say, you know, starting a study to really have definitive answers takes 15 years of tracking these kids at minimum. So, uh, uh, so, so it, there are two going on, but it's going to be another seven years before we have full data. But, but the logic makes sense if you look at it from an attachment theory perspective. Um, Diana, any last comment on that before I close up? No, I think we've covered it. Thank you. So I, I wanted to thank everyone for attending this webinar and uh, hats off to Dr. Waller and Dr. Kaffa for a really fascinating discussion on a complex topic. Um, there were a few questions that we couldn't answer that we'll include in a follow-up email with the slides in the recording. There was a specific question about using the butrans or buprenorphine patch um, because there's certainly protocols that allow the use of the butrans patch to prevent withdrawal symptoms when you're transferring from opioids to buprenorphine. And there's a protocol for this in a document on the CHCF website, buprenorphine, everything you want to know. And there's a lot of good information in that document that we wrote um, with the assistance of addiction specialists. So we'll consult our experts about whether this uh, approach is useful in pregnancy and include that in the follow-up email along with the reference to the buprenorphine FAQ. And the last um, comment is that CHCF is very interested in increasing access to maternal addiction treatment in California. If you are in an area that does not have this access and you're interested in working with us, please do reach out to me by email. Um, my email is kpiper at chcf.org. We are um, aiming to build some coaching and mentoring resources, and um, Dr. Diana Casa has also done that work in rural California to help people start up new programs where primary care doctors or OBGYNs or midwives and nurse practitioners work together to make sure women can get the treatment and pregnancy they need, can deliver locally and have their infant cared for, and can go home with a healthy baby. 
So thank you all, and uh, we will continue to um, email you future opportunities um, with our, our monthly CHCF newsletter. Take care, and thank you.